Civilization, Mr. Lassiter here, and in this video we're looking at national unification and the big picture. Basically we'll see the results of nationalism uniting countries like Italy and Germany, and we will see that fragile balance of power uh, become disturbed in this time. We're also going to see some reforms that European countries uh, undertake in order to avoid having revolution, uh, as we saw in uh, the early to mid-1800s. Uh, lots of vocabulary here, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's review a little bit. Uh, the Congress of Vienna, if you remember, began in 1815, and that was a response to Napoleon's romp around Europe where he decided he wanted to conquer everybody. Uh, so Europeans defeat Napoleon, and they want to establish that balance of power. And they decide to meet periodically with each other in order to maintain this balance. And we call these meetings the Concert of Europe. This is successful for a while, um, but that fragile balance of power that was in Europe would eventually be challenged, and Russia is mainly to fault for this because they have ambitions to expand into the Balkan Peninsula, which you can see uh, in the image on your right. It's the peninsula where we find Greece and Serbia and Bulgaria. Um, Russia really wanted to come into this area to challenge the Ottoman Empire, but also to gain access uh, to the Mediterranean Sea and thus, in addition to the Ottomans, challenge the British uh, for naval dominance. Well, not everybody's going to take this lying down, so we'll get a war. Uh, and that war is the Crimean War, which breaks out in 1853. Russia invades the Turkish Balkan provinces, uh, and the Ottoman Empire declares war on Russia. Because Great Britain and France don't want Russia uh, expanding, they form an alliance with the Ottomans. The Crimean War basically is the first modern war that we see uh, in, in the world. It's fought with modern weaponry, more modern tactics, but they still got some a ways to go. Um, and it is poorly planned and fought overall, but heavy losses make the Russians seek peace in 1856 and go home with their tail between their legs. The long-term effects of this is that con that concert of Europe that we have been talking about where people were working together, these countries working together in order to establish a balance of power, that is going to be destroyed. Austria and Russia, who are very important and strong nations looking to maintain order, they are now enemies. And Russia will largely uh, withdraw from European affairs for about the next 20 years or so. So the concert of Europe, everything's in danger. No longer a country's going to come to each other's aid to put down rebel rebellions like we saw with Russia coming in to uh, put down a Hungarian nationalist revolt in, in Austria in our last video. Um, and so this is going to open up a small window for nationalist revolts to be successful. And the first one we see is in Italy. And if you recall, Italy had had unsuccessful attempts at rebellion in 1848. Austria was still a dominant power in, it, in Italy, but Italy as a whole was split up, split up into many different states. Uh, there were areas controlled by Austria, areas that were independent, areas controlled by the Pope. And so uh, Italians looked toward the state of Piedmont, which you see here in yellow, uh, to um, be a leader in uh, this fight for unification. So in the north, a guy named Camillo di Cavour leads Piedmont in a war against Austria, which united much of northern Italy. In the south, Giuseppe Garibaldi raised an army, which took over most of southern Italy. And then they come together and they unite. Uh, and a new kingdom of Italy is established in 1861. Uh, Venetia was added in 1866 and Rome in 1870. And for the first time since basically the Roman Empire, we see a united Italy. Uh, in in this uh, peninsula. Germany is also one of our other areas that is fragmented and is split into lots of different uh, regions. And if you recall, in 1848, Germany also sought unification but failed. And so they start to look toward Prussia for leadership in this. If you recall, Prussia was this dominant uh, empire um, and it was a strong state known for its king, of having a strong king and a strong military. And so uh, we see that these states will, will turn to Prussia to try uh, to unite the region. Um, another major player in this is Count Otto von Bismarck, 
who was appointed by the strong king, King William I, as prime minister. And from about 1862 to 1866, Bismarck will rule Germany without having to worry about any input from, from the leg legislature. So Prussia is a strong military power in this region, and they are going to fight wars with Denmark Austri and Austria um, around this time period. Uh, and you can see some of the battles on, on the map there. Uh, ultimately, uh, big picture idea, they form a northern German confederation, and they ally with southern German states. Uh, and they do this against France, who's becoming more and more of a power in the region. And we see another war break out in 1870. And if you uh, recall, as I said, the concert of Europe had broken down, and so it's just complete chaos in Europe during this time. 1870, the Franco-Prussian War breaks out, and you have Prussian and German allied forces uh, who fight against the French, and they defeat the French, and they sign a peace treaty in 1871. And once they get all this big celebration, they decide, hey, you know what, this is working out pretty well. They all unite together. They proclaim the king, William I, emperor of the Second German Empire. And for the first time, we see a united Germany. Uh, this new state of Germany will be the strongest power in Europe. And if you look at the map, it basically included all of Prussia, as well as those northern German and southern German states, and part of France, Alsace and Lorraine, which are annexed uh, following the defeat of the French in the Franco-Prussian War. So all of a sudden, ta-da, we have two great new independent countries, uh, Italy and Germany. So what's happening in our other regions of Europe? Uh, well, Great Britain is going to manage to avoid the same type of revolutionary upheavals that we saw in the rest of Europe. Uh, and they did this mainly through changing their laws. In 1832, they expand the right to vote to the industrial middle class, so that keeps that group from clamoring for, for more rights, because now they have them. Um, and then there are other reforms that want to keep the country stable, whether it's uh, work, changes in working conditions or uh, minimum hours or lessening child labor or whatever it might be, um, Britain was willing to change to keep stability in their country. Um, the leader of Britain during this time uh, is Queen Victoria, who you see pictured here, who lends her name to a time period known as the Victorian Age. And we talked a little bit about that in our Weird History the other day. France, of course, has more ups and downs. Uh, in 1848, France had turned to restoring, or after 1848, they turned to restoring the monarchy after they had spent all that time making sure they get a republic. So in 1852, a vote led to the president, Louis Napoleon, becoming an emperor, Napoleon III. He was authoritarian, uh, but he did do things like expand the economy and build railroads and modernize the city of Paris. Um, and he is going to rule basically as an autocrat in, in France because that's what France does. They go back and forth. Um, around 1860, though, oppositions start to arise, um, and Napoleon III decides to uh, expand some of those civil liberties which he had cut back. He gives the legislature more power um, in France. But that Franco-Prussian War happens in 1870, and we will see that second empire of France crumble. And we'll come back to France later. In Austria, after de being defeated by the Prussians in that war that I kind of mentioned offhand because there's so many things going on here, uh, the Austrian Empire has to make some concessions. And they make these to those nationalist Hungarians that had been revolting in the mid-1800s. Uh, in 1867, they reach a compromise with this nationalistic Hungarian group to create what is known as a dual monarchy. Uh, of Austria and Hungary. What does this mean? Each part of this empire, Austria and Hungary, had its own legislature, its own bureaucracy, and their own capital city. But they shared a single monarch, they shared a single army, and they kept the same foreign policy and system of finances. So it's almost like this is one united region split into two, two different states, but with one, one big guy in charge. Uh, the Hungarians were much happier, but if you recall, Aust the Austrian Empire was a multinational 
empire. And so there are a lot of other nationalities within Austria that are not so happy because they see Hungarians getting what they want, but they themselves are, are not being given the same rights. In Russia, if you, if you recall, they went home with their tail between their legs at the end of the Crimean War, and they have to make some serious reforms. Uh, the biggest reforms are made under the guy pictured here, Tsar Alexander II. He ended serfdom in Russia. He gave the right of serfs to own property and to marry. But peasants are still going to struggle in Russia. Uh, Alexander II couldn't make everyone happy. He couldn't make the liberals happy. He couldn't make the conservatives happy. And ultimately, he's assassinated by an anarchist in 1881. So there's a, a, a little bit of chaos going on. His son is going to turn against reform, and we'll kind of turn back to that old rep repressive Russia uh, that we've seen in the past. So what's the big picture here? Change in Europe was, go was outpacing what governments uh, wanted to do. The Industrial Revolution created so much change in the social system, in economics, in politics, uh, that chaos reigns in, in the 18th century, especially beginning in the mid, or in the 19th century, beginning in the mid 19th century. Uh, conservative attempts at maintaining, maintaining a balance of power uh, oftentimes conflicted with new ideologies like liberalism, nationalism, socialism in this time period. And by the late 1800s, the balance of power in Europe broke down completely. Europe had experienced several more wars and ultimately um, will kind of be on a path to massive, full-scale warfare in World War I. Uh, but before we get there, we will look and see how uh, they split up different regions of the world and, as Europeans like to do, drew a bunch of lines in Africa through imperialism. That's it today, guys. Uh, see you later.